<clears throat> As you can tell, rocking a pair of 3D glasses, so I just finished seeing a movie in 3D around the Transformers 3 Dark Side of the Moon. I will get some of the criticisms out of the way right off the bat. If you didn't like the parents, they're in this movie again, they're not used for a lot, they're in for a few minutes. And they're every bit as horrible as you remember from 1 and 2. They're really not that funny. Now, there is no, I think it was Skids and Mud Flaps. Those are the racist robots from 2. They are not in here. Instead, you remember the weird humping robot from 2? Apparently, he has a buddy. And those two live with Sam and New Girl. New Girl, who, of course, is a Victoria's Secret model. There are some scenes... If you saw the trailer, you see a scene where she's just standing there, and everything's like exploding behind her. And she has a look, like someone said, just look confused. They have that scene in the movie, and it does nothing even in 3D. She just looks really bad in that scene. Now, the the love story between her and Sam, it's, it's not bad. I mean, it's... This is Michael Bay we're talking about. He writes you know, dialogue for love about you know, the way of George Lucas. I mean, it's... It's nothing groundbreaking. The love story is, you know, they could probably trim the movie down a little bit if they would have trimmed that a little bit. That, that's all I'm really saying. That, that was pretty bad. And, and for the most part, you know, when it's dealing with the humans and the humans aren't fighting the robots, there's a lot of comedy which I thought was weird. Now, now actually in the actual, actual meat of the story. <clears throat> Apparently, when we went to the moon for Apollo, it was because a giant ship crashed there, which is where Sentinel Prime is at. Now, we come back with some samples, and we really don't go there again for a while. And this is like the huge backdrop to it, where they intersplice actual archival footage and newly done footage. In some cases, it's done pretty well. When they do the, uh, the John F. Kennedy sequences, the guy looks nothing like Kennedy. Nothing at all. So you can't go from like a, a black and white to a guy who looks nothing like Kennedy. When they do the scene where it's uh, Nixon talking to the astronauts, they do a good job in keeping the, the foreground image of Nixon on the phone more in focus than the background image of actor Nixon. So essentially, we went there to investigate this giant crash landing. And after a while, we just stopped going to the moon. Which you find out later, why all of a sudden the Americans and the Russians quit going to the moon? The Autobots are ironically helping to take care of certain uh, international problems to make sure that the humans don't destroy themselves. They go to Chernobyl, and that's where they find a piece of an old Autobot engine that ironically belonged to Sentinel Prime. This is what leads to the first meeting to see what I'll just call Tremor Decepticon. If you've seen the commercials, you've seen the thing that's like a giant, like a giant worm surrounded by other worms. That's the one that's primarily used by, I want to say Shockwave, who is one of the premier villains in this one, and they do a pretty dang good job for him. And then all of a sudden, once the Decepticons have their plans set into motion, yes, Megatron is still alive, he's a little bit worse for wear when you first see him. He's kind of weird and nomadic. But he's still taking care and dealing with things. And he actually decided to enlist human operatives to help them get everything together to actually activate what ends up being the giant space bridge. Which, if you've seen some of the trailers, that's when all of a sudden Decepticons just come pouring in by just... They say at the point that there's 200 Decepticons on the planet. And they're essentially just destroying everything. And that's where most of this movie actually is. It's just the Decepticons destroying things. Humans trying to fight them and Autobots fighting them. I did skip out a, a huge section of the subplot. Which deals primarily with some of the humans and some of the fallout. And a little bit of the Cold War and some of the space race. Because while it's actually fairly well conceived. They do moments with it that just are so over the top. And kind of ruin the seriousness of that situation of. Earth being overrun by giant robots who can assume the shapes of vehicles. 
know, Optimus does go back to just destroying so many things. You get to see his sword, his shield. You'd see him break off the axe and another sword. You know, the the ending fight, ending fight scene that you get, you get to see is absolute. I mean, in a lot of ways, it is brutal. I mean, they more or less kind of let you see, you know, like a head pretty much sliced in half. It's a robot head, it's a robot head. And then someone else kind of get their brains blown out. Again, robot brains, robot brains. So it is actually pretty violent. And when it comes down to the ending fight sequence that's done in Chicago, an hour away from me, I was actually at a trade show while they were doing some filming for it in Chicago. You know, they do kill a lot of people. And if people get shot, they kind of become like dust. So did Bay do a good job in actually making this war feel real? You know, people are dying. Robots are dying. More people are dying. Buildings are being destroyed left and right. You know, that's what makes this movie have this nice kind of epic, you know, summer blockbuster feel to it. The love story, meh. And there are times when, I don't mind some comedy. You know, Pirates of the Caribbean does a decent amount of comedy, you know, helps break up some of the tension and keeps things kind of lighthearted. In this one, you get moments where the comedy seems to just go, and just go, and you kind of go, eh. There's a lot of seriousness going on, and then you throw in, you know, Man, I'm... We're to wreck this ship. Ship. So we have to take your kids to go see it. The, the two small annoying robots, the one who has the humping robot from 2, who now has a weird friend who kind of like has smoke coming off his head, they'll probably emulate those two. And they're not bad. They're the weird sort of kind of cutesy, mischievous robots. And I'm going to make that. The robots in this are just ridiculous. You know, when they show Cybertron, it just looks insane. When they go to uh, the Ark and they're walking around it to try to get Sentinel Prime and some of the, the remaining pieces that create the bridge, it's it's immaculately done. And the transformation of the robots, great. There are, of course, some scenes where the believability is entirely tossed out the window. There's a scene where they're being chased and Bumblebee has to transform, which tosses Sam out of the car. He then catches Sam in mid-air in a Matrix-style move and then transforms back. And Sam is in the car just screaming because he thought for a minute first he was thrown from the car and now he's back inside the car. You get, you get lots of moments kind of like that. Do some of the main Autobots die? Yes. So the main Decepticons die? Yes. Is it heartbreaking in most ways? Which is actually kind of weird, because it's, it's an intelligent robot who transforms into a semi, or transforms into a, you know, into a Camaro. But the way they do it, they actually invoke a small amount of emotion from the actual you know, CGI itself. So, if you hated the second one, they do fix some mistakes. They, they definitely did tone down... There is still some racist humor, but it's not as bad. You know, you don't have two concept cars tossing back, you know, urban colloquialisms like, like crazy. So you don't have, it's not that bad. And the woman that got to replace Megan Fox, knowing that her previous job was lingerie model, they make that apparent in the very first scene you see her. Because you don't see all of her. It's very reminiscent of the first time we saw Scarlett Johansson in Lost in Translation. So, all in all for her job as being the hot girl, she did a decent job of it. And I really can't say anything bad about her because her boyfriend is Jason Statham. Is it worth to see in 3D? You know, I saw it 3D at like a like, like a 7 o'clock showing. So it cost me and my wife like 20 bucks to go see it. And knowing that's like a shade under 3 hours, you actually do get your money's worth. I'd probably recommend if you want to see it in 3D, potentially catching the matinee if you do cheaper prices for that. Because is it worth 10 bucks a piece you know, in my area? Um pretty close to it. Would I rather have spent like seven? Yes. So, if you like the first one, and the second one kind of turns you off, they, they do they do, they do do a better job than the second one. And if you're like me, it's just great seeing Optimus Prime go nuts and destroy Decepticons. 